Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, Governor Walls and legislative leaders talk about gun policy and key lawmakers weigh in on work that needs to be done in elder care, child care and legislative process reform. Plus, we meet the Senate's newest member. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program, I'm Shannon Lurkey. At a legislative briefing between the Capitol Press Corps, the governor and legislative leaders, a number of issues were addressed, including whether gun safety legislation will move this session. Here's what the governor and leaders had to say. I think that Minnesotans have been very loud and clear in asking for this. And I, ha I think that as an American in society today, you have to look at the carnage that happened in Sandy Hook, in Las Vegas, in churches, in restaurants, on college campuses. And at a certain point, you have to say to yourself, honestly, in the United States of America, we don't have a school safety problem. We have a gun violence problem. And if we have a gun violence problem, then we have to do something to address that problem. I would take Melissa's statement one step further and say, it's actually a mental health crisis that we have. Um, and in other parts of the, of the world, uh, you see people driving a big truck into a crowd of people or taking a knife to people. Um, and the reality is uh, we, we need to figure out why people want to hurt other people. Um, and, and get to the bottom of that. We've, we, we have a mental health crisis in this state. I can see that we're, we're split. Uh, what I will tell you that I've had a conversation with uh, Senator Warren Limmer of Judiciary, and he wants to have a, a comprehensive overview of guns. So not, uh, not just gun laws or future gun laws, uh, but also the benefits of those that uh, uh, own gun shops and the benefits of those that like to hunt, 500,000 deer hunters, that ha and many of them have a semi-automatic semi rifle that some people might want to ban. And so there's, it's, it's, it's complex. Uh, so that's part of what we'll do this year. Uh, last year we had uh, some unfinished business that I think we can do. We, we passed uh, $25 million of safe school money, uh, which went to making the school building safer, but also mental health resources. Uh, we put it in three different bills. One of those bills got signed. Uh, but I talked to some folks from Education Minnesota just within the last two weeks, and they said that there was over $200 million of demands for safe schools. And so that's a, a potential area that we could use one-time money. So point is, uh, there, there's going to be robust discussion without a doubt. Uh, I know that there are certain things that I will be able to get done. Those are the ones that I'm going to put most of my energy on and then we'll see on the other sides of it. I, personally, as a, a gun owner, I, you know, I don't think that we need more expansion, but uh, there are many people that do, and so that's where we're going to have an interesting debate. I think the gun show thing is something that could be resolved. Where you lose me is you, when you tell me that I can't sell my shotgun to my neighbor, who has lived with me my entire life. We have lived next door to each other. And you tell me, oh, he's got to go down to the county sheriff's office and get a background check before I can sell a gun to Irv or to Gary. That's where you, and I think that's where you lose most gun owners. And I think that's what's not, not well representative in the polling that you see that everyone hangs their hat on. I, I think the assumptions are they're talking about retail background checks. I think the assumptions in the polling is not you can't sell your gun to your neighbor, you can't give a gun to your son. I would have to echo Speaker Hortman's uh, sentiments that society changes rapidly and there's expectations that we, we adjust to that. Uh, if you want to know what I saw a lot about, there are a lot of these suburban votes were, were predicated on this issue of safety, a, a large piece of them. Safety, health care and education and, and gun safety wrapped up into that. Uh, I understand and I think there's not as much difference as you hear on a very volatile issue and, and there's Four folks up here were talking pretty candidly about this, of trying to strike what is the age-old question, striking the constitutional and personal freedoms versus societal safety pieces on that. And when you look at the research, we're not going to reduce all of them, no, but things like red flags laws and gun show loopholes do have the potential to reduce some of those. And what I think they do more of is they show us that we can work together to listen to each other's side on this and strike some proper balance.
To continue addressing the myriad challenges facing Minnesota families, whether caring for young children or aging parents, the Senate has created a new committee called the Family Care and Aging Committee. The committee's chair, Senator Karin Housley, joins me now to talk more about it. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Shannon. Building on the work from last session, you've promoted a series of reforms called No Senior Ignored. Uh, what are some of these reforms? And in a press release, you said they echo on bills, measures that were passed last year but were vetoed by the governor. So what's part of this package? What are you promoting? Uh, and these are mostly uh, what I've already dropped this session is pretty much what we passed the House and Senate last year and was vetoed by the governor. Um, but we've, we've done it a little differently and we've split it up. Um, so electronic monitoring, which is cameras in the residence room, is going to be traveling on its own, that bill. Uh, and I've already met with Representative Schultz in the House. Uh, and they, are, they have been really easy to work with and uh, want to get something done on this also. Uh, now that she's the chair of the new committee in the House, she's, she's excited to get working on this and realizes that there is a lot of agreement on it. Um, so that one's going to go on its own first, and hopefully we can get that done passed early in session. I'm hoping by the end of February. It's a lot of committees it has to go through judiciary and, and a lot of other committees. But then the other bill, the big elder care bill, um, it contains all of the provisions. If there's, let's say there's an issue that happens at a nursing home or a senior living and it, it's reported to the Office of the Health Facility Complaints. Previously, a family member wasn't allowed to know if their family member, their loved one, was an object or a target of that investigation. So that's a data privacy thing. So that will be addressed in there. Also, um, more oversight of the Office of Health Facility Complaints. Also, um, the Department of Health Commissioner will have more oversight of the Home Care Bill of Rights and be able to find these facilities. So we're putting a lot of those good things that, that did get vetoed by the governor back in the bill. And hopefully we'll get the, uh, some good collaboration with, with Representative Schultz, the chair of that committee. And from what I've talked to her, it sounds good because we want to get done what was agreed upon. Let's get that off the table and out the door so, so the consumers, so the family members on, on this side of it go, okay, they're getting their work done and so let's get that done quickly. And then assisted licensure or assisted living licensure might take a little bit longer for that framework, but that's also in the bill. We might have to pull that out and have it run separately, but that's something we also have to address. So there's a lot of pent up energy to get movement done on elder care. Uh, what are you looking for? Uh, you know, and, and I was so uh, glad that uh, Governor Walls uh, reappointed Commissioner Malcolm, Jan Malcolm, to the Department of Health because she did a lot of work in the uh, interim during the summer and the fall, bringing all of the stakeholders together. And there was a lot more agreement than we had even in May. So some of the things that were in that bill in May, we don't even need anymore because they've agreed upon them. So, and I've talked to Representative Schultz in the House, so we are going to, whatever has been agreed upon, we are going to move that as quickly as we can, whether it's the cameras, which we pretty much have agreement on, and some of those other things that are in the bill. And again, working with Commissioner Malcolm, moving those things quickly and getting them done, whether it's the data privacy or whether it's oversight by the OHFC, uh, those things are going to move quickly and hopefully we can get them done by the end of February. And from the articles that I've read in the, in the newspapers, all of the stakeholders are really working with the legislature to get stuff done. Yeah, I, and we all, it was a lot of meetings this summer that Commissioner Malcolm pulled together and everybody was there from the consumers, the family members to the providers, from leading age to care providers, um, and us legislators were there. So everybody finally is coming to consume, uh, people are going to have to give on both sides. Not everybody's going to get everything they want, but we've come such a long way and it was really important work, so I look forward to getting that done quickly. I think another big topic this session is going to be the lack of accessibility and affordability of child care. In 2017, the Center for Rural Policy and Development issued a report calling it a quiet crisis, but I don't think it's quiet anymore. Yeah. How bad is it really? It's really bad. It is, uh, and I traveled all throughout the state this summer also, and Senator Bill Weber held um, child care listening sessions, and you hear it especially in greater Minnesota, all of the employers, they can't hire people because the employees can't get child care for their, for their kids. Uh, we've lost almost 3,500 child care providers in, the, in Minnesota in the last eight years. So we really have to, we really have to figure out what is going on, why are, why are uh, home uh, child care providers just uh, quitting? And even of those that we do have right now, 70% of them have said, have said that they are thinking about getting out of it too because the, the state regulations are just so um, overburdensome and expensive. So about the state regulations, because you've spoken about the need to roll back some of those regulations, 
how difficult will it be to find a balance that will keep children safe? I mean, those regulations were put there for a reason. So to keep the kids safe but not be so onerous that people won't open their homes or start daycare centers. I mean, there's different issues with both of those, but but in, in terms of regulations. Right, right. And, and and this is this was uh, my daughter. I'm, I'm a grandma. Uh, I've got a three-year-old and a one-year-old grandson, and my daughter and her husband were having the same issue trying to find childcare. And it, it is, it's so expensive. A lot of uh, parents are choosing just to stay home, just to bypass that cost. Um, but we do have to strike a balance of a, a child care center and a home child care provider being uh, safe. Um, but yeah, yeah, not having it being so overburdensome because we, we really do want to have good and safe child care providers here in our state. But when so many of them are getting out of the business and they're citing that the state regulations are the reason, there's something wrong there. So we have to really work on that. One thing that you mentioned at a recent press conference was uh, requiring the Department of Human Services to put those regulations in plain language so that, you know, it doesn't take somebody with a master's degree or a law degree to understand some of those. And also, I think I saw something about uniform applications for all counties. So easing yeah. the, the paperwork and the requirements for people so that it just doesn't seem quite so scary? Well, and it is, and you know how it is in government. It, they speak government language, and it is not, it's not easy. I still look at some of the things that come in the mail from my mom when it comes to uh, the IRS or even the Minnesota Department of Revenue and Social Security, and it's like, what does this say? And so for a child care provider to just want to simply open their home to one, two, or three families, the, the language that they're being sent, they can't understand it. I can't understand it. So making that easier we're, in, in that bill that we dropped, um, is requiring the Department of Human Services to make that language more clear for the child care provider. And then just one other thing, uh, there's uh, going to be a bill that would perhaps increase funding for startups and create expansion grants. Does child care just need to be subsidized considering the high cost of providing it and the need is so desperate, in, especially in greater Minnesota, but also here in the cities? Well, I don't know if we have to subsidize it because there are child care grants that have been working. There's over a thousand of them that worked in the last biennium. Um, so I think creating more of those and getting applicants to recognize that this is available to them, but creating more of those because there's and they were successful. So if we can if we can figure out ways to get some resources to put towards more grants, I think that will really work. Senator Housley, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Representative Ryan Winkler left the House of Representatives in 2015, but has just returned to the legislature and been elected House Majority Leader. He joins me in the studio to talk a little about his background and whether more transparency can be brought to the legislative process. Thanks for being here. Happy to do so. So a little biographical information, you come from a close-knit family in Bemidji, your dad was a small business owner, and yet you found your way to Harvard. I'm a small town girl, so I can imagine that must have been frightening. What inspired you to go so far away to such a prestigious school? Well, for me, it was learning that it was possible. Uh, I was walking down the hallway in high school one day, and there was a sign up on the door that said, are you interested in Harvard or the Ivy League? Come to a meeting. And a Bemidji High School graduate who was currently at Harvard came back with a message that if we got good test scores and did well in school, that we would have a good chance of getting admitted. And regardless if we're admitted of our family's financial circumstances, the school would make it affordable for us. And um, that was a kind of life-changing uh, meeting for me. And I went home from school that day and that told my mom I wanted to go to Harvard. And uh, my parents rolled up their sleeves to help figure out how we could make that possible and um, including we had a garage sale in order to buy airplane tickets to go out and look at the school and then um, my dad who likes to talk with everyone got to be such good friends with the admissions counselor that in the end they said oh don't tell him not to worry we'll admit him well, so it was it was uh, it was just a you know it was a great opportunity for me and you're in a way you're describing an adventurous spirit which goes to my next question you initially won the same house seat in 2006, but left in 2015 to support your wife's career move to Belgium. So you went to Europe. Uh, you have a unique perspective then, so that's the adventurous part, mm -hmm. going to Europe. Uh, you've been able to be in the legislature and then look at it from afar. Now you're back. How has it changed? Has it changed? 
Well, I'm only getting back into it after being gone for three years. I've heard stories, and the stories about it don't seem to be very uh, promising from, from what I can tell. Uh, the major omnibus bills uh, being put together by leaders with provisions that have never been heard before in committees, having only you know, a short amount of time to read a thousand page plus piece of legislation, uh, committee rules and house rules being disregarded. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's been very positive. And from a distance, it looked like Governor Dayton and uh, Representative Doubt really were not in a very good place as far as a negotiating relationship goes. And so I think the relationships and the personalities were kind of at an end point after this last session. And I don't think the legislative process could get any worse than it was in the end of the 2018 session. Uh, so I think it really creates a necessity and an opportunity to do things differently and better in the House and in the legislature as a whole. So potentially one way of doing things better would be eliminating the omnibus bill that you mentioned, the mm -hmm. nearly 1,000-page bill from last session. There's also committee bills that get done where almost the entire session's worth of work gets put in one committee bill. Critics argue that this violates the single-subject clause of the state constitution. Should bills be smaller, do you agree that that single-subject clause should be followed and these large bills need to be eliminated? Well, we definitely need to move in the other direction. We need to move towards having more bills carried by more individual members relating to discrete uh, per policy issues. There will be committee appropriation bills with policy language in them uh, because often policy has to go with the uh, money that we are appropriating. So large committee bills are just a reality of how what it takes to get you know, a huge amount of work done for a $45 billion budget in 120 days. So some of that work has to be consolidated, but it has gone too far, and we should have uh, committees doing more bills individually and sending them off to be passed separately as much as possible. Now, one rule change that was passed on opening day in the House um, changed how bills move between committees. Under Republican control, bills had to be re-referred on the floor, which... Uh, some argued makes it clear to people where that bill is in the process. When this happened, opening day, Minority Leader Kurt Dowd said this, this particular rule change will make the process less transparent because lobbyists, followers of bills will not necessarily know where that bill is. Why make this move? Will it simplify things? Well, first of all, the uh, antics of the minority leader on opening day was they were just political theater. There is really no merit whatsoever, in my mind, to the argument that somehow the legislature will be less transparent because committee, uh, a committee chair can move some bills by memorandum. Those memorandums, uh, memorandum will be public. Uh, the system for tracking bills will stay the same. People will always know where the bill is, just as they do today. The only difference is that we don't have to go to the House floor just for the purpose of moving bills from one committee to another. And that allows us to have more time to do the, the work in committee. And it's only in committee where the public has an opportunity to weigh in and testify and, and kind of be part of the legislative process. So it actually pushes us more towards committee work, less time spent with political theatrics on the floor. And it aligns better with the Republican Senate and how they organize their bills and move them uh, in their committee structure. So the House and Senate, Republican and Democrat, will be better aligned in the committee structure as a result of the changes. One last question. Former Representative Jim Knobloch in a recent Min Post article said that lawmakers give too much of their own power to their leaders. Is there a remedy for this? You know, in past sessions, so many deals are being done, end of session, behind closed doors, just the leaders present. Is there a remedy? I think, yes, and I think it comes from uh, two directions. First of all, individual members should demand to be part of it and not just be content to let leaders make these decisions and do all this behind the scenes work. And the leaders themselves should recognize that they will get a better outcome for the things that they care about, that the whole caucus or the whole state cares about, if more work is done by committee and it is oppor there's opportunity for public input and where individual members can weigh in and bring their expertise to bear along with outside groups or state agencies. If more of that work is done by members in committee or in conference committees instead of behind closed doors, that work product will be better. And that comes from the leaders. Mr. Leader, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me.
Two bipartisan press conferences were held back to back at the Capitol this week to propose law changes meant to deter distracted driving. On a bipartisan basis, uh, we are advancing legislation to make our roads safer and prevent needless deaths and injuries on our highways. Distracted driving is the fastest growing cause of road accidents in Minnesota. And this epidemic claimed 59 lives in 2017 and caused 223 serious injuries. We are determined to move forward with this hands-free legislation this year. I think it's the right year to do it in. And I will tell you that uh, just my view of the world when it comes to uh, uh, cell phone use while you're driving an automobile, uh, I think it has uh, come to be a universal danger to us on the highways. Right now, texting while driving is only a $50 fine. We change that. We have to get people's attention. That will change to first offense, 150, second offense, 250, third offense, 500, and to add to the fifth, third and subsequent offenses, we will impound and take your cell phone from you. Public safety professionals are saying that being distracted by your cell phone is the same um, equivalent as being um, intoxicated, that we have to have our laws match. And uh, driving while intoxicated, we have to have our laws match. And I think time and time again, when you talk to folks in not only in my district, but across the state, the sentences that they're receiving are not matching the tragedy that has happened and occurred. Following the retirement of Senate President Michelle Fischbach to assume the role of Lieutenant Governor, Senator Jeff Howe won the seat to represent District 13 in the recent November election. The Senate's newest lawmaker now joins me in the studio. Welcome. Thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be here. You are not new to the legislature. You served in the House since 2012. But now that you are in the Senate so far, how is it different? Well, I don't know if it's that different. Uh, it's down the hall a little bit. but. I think the biggest change for me is trying to new, meet the new staff, understand who I need to talk to to get a certain bill written and drafted. So that's the biggest change. But other than that, it's pretty similar. So process is the same, but it's a new cast of characters in terms of getting things done. Absolutely. Uh, throughout the campaign, what issues did you hear most frequently about from your constituents? Well, as you know, we the cost of health insurance was the big big issue that uh, I will say health cost of health insurance uh, abortion uh, pro-life stuff mm -hmm. and then uh, gun rights stuff are the three that I've heard I heard the most of so big three issues in your district has it traditionally been kind of those issues in district 13 uh, uh, I think the new one uh, for the last probably four or five years has been the health insurance rates that's mm -hmm. been a, a, high a, a high cost of health insurance that's been a, a big one here just recently. But the other two, uh, uh, right to life and gun issues have been pretty much there for quite a bit. And it's possible that the gun issue will come up in this next legislative session because of the change in control of the House. There, the suburban districts, there's a feeling that they're really going to be um, looking for change in terms of gun safety regulations. But then here in the Senate, there is the desire to move more cautiously. So I assume that you, you fall in that category. I, I do, I do. I, I don't, I think that good people follow laws and the people that are gonna do bad things, they're not gonna follow the laws anyway. So I, I'm looking for a solution that'll actually do the right thing for those people that need the safety that is, aren't going to harm and not going to restrict the good people from being able to protect themselves and, and do uh, operate the way that they always have. So any measures would target the people who, who would do harm and not uh, inconvenience those law-abiding citizens? Let's go after the criminals. Right. Absolutely. You spent nearly four decades in the Minnesota Army National Guard. How does that experience shape your views as a lawmaker? Uh, well, I think it helped me focus on facts, uh, especially when you're in combat zones, when you're doing those types of things. Emotions run high, but you have to do 
you have to put those emotions away. And there's a lot of I've, what I've learned here in the legislature. There's a lot of emotional topics. Emotions run high, but you have to be able to look for the facts, identify those things that uh, that are going to make the bills good, and take that emotion aside because. Uh, you can't run on feelings. You gotta, you gotta look to the facts and develop facts and assumptions. And what assumptions you can make facts will help strengthen and direct you in the right path and, and make it successful at the end. And so that's that military and being able to work with people because I tell you what, everybody in the military, most of them are Type A per personalities. People in the legislature are Type A personalities. So you have to be able to navigate that. And I think that has prepared me well for for working here. You're talking about type A personalities and, and you also uh, spent almost three decades working in various roles in terms of in the fire service. So you've got military and fire in your background. You're talking about a type A personality. Makes me think you might be a bit of an adrenaline junkie. You know, I will say that I'm a, if I'm a junkie, I'm a junkie trying to help people. And that's what drove me into the fire service. That's, uh, uh, you know, I've been helping people my whole life. I think after my first deployment, when I came back, uh, that first deployment actually probably did turn me into an adrenaline junkie. I, uh, I came back, it, and it's, it's difficult. When you come back from war, uh, you do miss that excitement because every, you, you, everything is critical. You need to do everything right or people die. And Being you come a back here, a and it's, it's, life. It, it, you, yes. yeah, we, over, and the, the this focus shifts because over there, I didn't have to worry about what I was going to wear. I didn't have to worry about what I was going to eat, where I was going to eat, what I was going to do. Everything was pretty much scripted. You come back here, I got to decide what I'm going to wear. Mm -hmm. I got to decide what I if I'm going to go to the grocery store, if I'm going to go to the restaurant. There's a lot more pressures. Gee whiz, I got to pay for the roof over my head. I've got a, oh, I need a car insurance. I need to buy gas. Everything over there was paid for. Right. It's daily living here is a challenge. Daily living over here is a challenge and different focus. And I know that veterans issues are very important to you. So briefly, just give me a few thoughts on that. Uh, you know, our state, when I came in the legislature, was one of the bottom five states for veterans. Now. And I'm not taking credit for this. A lot of people worked very hard to get us to now one of the top five. In the I will say that we've got more work to do, and we're going to continue to do that work. We got one university in this state that is considered veteran friendly. We need to fix that. We need to make sure that veterans can get their jobs, hold their jobs. I tell you what, we we're getting there, and I'm proud of what we've done. There's more a little work bit to do. more to do. Senator Howe, welcome to the Senate and thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.